ESPN News, this is Montana This Morning. We get a close-up look at a major training drill happening at the Bozeman Yellowstone International Airport. Fears grow over Israel's potential ground invasion into Rafah. I'm Ian Lee with renewed fighting between Israel and Hamas. Already it is 6 o'clock on this Monday morning. Jade McDonald and Matt Elwell with you. Well, you can't really see the bridges too terribly well no, off of our Montana State Campus. They're out there. A little bit of light rain in parts mm. of the area. We're going to have to deal with that throughout the morning. Mm. The afternoon's not warming up. And we have a lot of wind. Great. So uh, <laughs> it's an active weather week here right. in southwest Montana. We're starting off with pretty mild temperatures mm. for the early morning. But uh, it's you said it earlier, deceiving, because yeah. we're going to be dealing with wind this afternoon. We're not warming up dramatically throughout the day today. We're going to be locked into some spotty showers, uh, mostly cloudy skies. You may see a few rays of sunshine here or there, right. but uh, overall we're looking at windy and cooler conditions as you go into the afternoon. Heaviest rain expected to move in over the next couple of days. Uh, spotty showers out there, maybe a little bit of patchy fog with some light wind. That light wind won't last long. Uh, 20 to 40 mile an hour wind speeds expected throughout the day today. Uh, both for Bozeman and Butte. I'm going to talk more about how long this wind's going to last and what to expect in just a few minutes. All right, thank you very much, Matt. Now, Butte Silverbell Coroner Lori Durnkin tells MTN News that she doesn't suspect foul play into the death of 34-year-old Joshua Hulinger. Now, Joshua Hulinger is a 34 man from Butte who was found dead at around 845 in the morning by a passerby along Blacktail Creek Trail earlier this week. Now, Durling says that they are still awaiting toxicology reports to determine the exact cause of death. And if there is ever a major crash at the Bozeman Yellowstone International Airport, first responders from across the area want to be ready for the worst case scenario. And our custody powers was there as the crews held a drill to prepare in case there is a major incident. If you saw tons of ambulances and fire trucks rushing towards Bozeman International Airport Saturday morning, don't worry, it wasn't a real emergency. It was their triennial full-scale aircraft accident exercise. Operations rescue. Rescue group operations. Today we're practicing a regional jet aircraft uh, having an accident here at the airport. A uh, number of uh, 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 fatalities and a number of uh, injured and uh, you know working through the process to handling all of that uh, if it were a real situation. Brian Springer is the chief executive officer at the Bozeman Yellowstone International Airport. He tells me about the triennial full-scale aircraft accident exercise they held Saturday morning. We're looking at about 200 uh, people involved in this uh, today. There was a large crew on scene. First responders included the airport fire department, mutual aid from Central Valley Fire Department, ambulances, and medical aid from Bozeman Health Deccanese Regional Medical Center. There were also 45 actors who volunteered as the injured and fatalities that first responders were able to practice life-saving procedures on. Springer tells me it's important for all those involved in the mock accident to have this opportunity to work together. Especially in a situation like this, no one entity can handle everything. It takes a, it takes a large group of people. The full-scale aircraft accident exercise occurs every three years. Springer tells me as each year goes by, new technology is introduced to the airport and first responders, so they have to stay up to date. With changes in communication ability, new radio systems and things like that, uh, it's really important for us to get the opportunity to use those. The full-scale aircraft accident exercise lasted from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Bozeman Yellowstone Airport and was a success. But Springer tells me, although they've been performing these mock accidents since around the 60s. Well, every time we practice, uh, we learn new things about how we can do things better. In Belgrade, Cassidy Powers, MTN News. And on the international scene, rocket fire continued over the weekend in the Middle East with talks between Israel and Hamas once again stalling. An attack by Hamas militants shut down a major crossing for desperately needed humanitarian aid in Gaza. Calls for action on a ceasefire continue to grow in Israel and around the world, including on dozens of college campuses. But a ceremony marking Holocaust Remembrance Day Israel's Prime Minister signaled that he will not bow to international pressure. CBS News' Ian Lee has the latest from London. 
Hamas militants fired rockets at a key humanitarian aid crossing between Israel and the Gaza Strip, prompting its closure. Assistance was later airdropped. Israeli defense officials say at least three soldiers were killed in the strike, several others wounded. Today, the IDF encouraged the evacuation of parts of Rafah after firing toward what it says were the launch sites of the Hamas rockets. It all comes as peace talks hit another impasse over the weekend, with both sides blaming one another. At a Holocaust Remembrance Day ceremony, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said his country will defeat its enemies and seem to rebuff on the global push for a ceasefire. No amount of pressure, no decision by any international forum will stop Israel from defending itself. Protests critical of Israel's war in Gaza continue on college campuses around the U.S. as graduation season gets into full swing. Demonstrators temporarily disrupted the University of Michigan's commencement on Saturday. Police cleared out encampments at the University of Virginia and the University of Southern California. USC is replacing its main graduation ceremony with an event at the L.A. Coliseum later this week. Standing up for what's right is a little bit more important than me being able to walk across the stage. Meanwhile, over the weekend, Israel's war cabinet voted to close news outlet Al Jazeera's offices, accusing it of airing anti-Israel incitement. Al Jazeera called the order very dangerous. Ian Lee, CBS News. And CIA Director William Burns is in the Middle East as a key negotiator in the talks between Israel and Hamas. A source with knowledge of the talks told CBS News that he went to Qatar for an emergency meeting with the country's leader, and that the Hamas delegation also traveled to Qatar. There are also Israeli media reports that Burns could meet with Israeli Prime Minister later today. Now a little bit closer to home, it's been over eight months since the wildfires in Hawaii. The state's attorney general just released the first phase of an investigation. National correspondent Dan Grossman with more on the reports of the findings. 400 pages of interviews, topography maps, weather reports, and social media posts lay out an incredibly detailed timeline of the Lahaina fires that killed 101 people last summer. Everyone is accountable. So why isn't our government agency being accountable? Through a broken Zoom connection, Rebecca Loricella explains how she still feels broken after losing her home to the Lahaina fire last August. On Wednesday, Hawaii's Attorney General's Office released its first major report on the fire in conjunction with the Fire Safety Research Institute. The report lays out the timeline of the fire and the factors that made it so deadly, including high winds and low humidity, among other factors. It also does not blame first responders, a common critique among locals after the fire. We are grossly understaffed, undertrained, under-equipped. Rebecca, a former fire marshal and former employee for Maui's Emergency Management Agency, knows the inner workings of how the response came together. She also knows the pain of what she says are some of its shortcomings. There's, there's nothing that could have prepared the highest level of training and, and preparation for what I saw. Less than a year after the fire, Laura Cella says she's not seen enough help for the rebuilding of Lahaina and the recovery of her community's mental health. Going forward, the report states that questions linger about the adequacy of warning systems, evacuation planning, and the preparedness of communities for such fire events. Answers to those questions may be revealed in phase two of the Attorney General Office's investigation, which is expected to be released later this year. Dan Grossman, Scripps News, Denver. And in this morning's Montana Agriculture Report, as the world's climate changes, climate smart agriculture practices are at the forefront of people's minds. And for this week's Montana Ag Report, we discuss how the government is doing what it can to encourage climate smart agriculture practices across the country. The U.S. Department of Agriculture's Farm Service Agency, or FSA, wants to remind producers that farm loan programs can be used in ways that support climate smart agriculture practices. And many such practices are already incorporated into farmers and ranchers routines, such as cover cropping, nutrient management, and conservation tillage. Current farm loan programs offered by the FSA can help cover the cost to implement these practices. 
The USDA says, quote, establishment of rotational grazing systems, precision agriculture equipment or machinery for conver conver conversion, excuse me, to no-till residue management, livestock facility, air scrubber or waste treatment and cross fencing are all potentially covered by the loans. The FSA is also doing what they can to streamline the loan application process in order to make agriculture needs more accessible. Now, as we are getting closer and closer to the start of the Special Olympics Montana Summer Games for 2024, Scott Breen has a highlight of one of our athletes. On any given morning, afternoon or evening, even if it's a little chilly out, you might find Keith King trying to stay in shape near the track and field pits. But that is just the beginning of his story. Running pretty hard like this. Keith is happy to give out pointers on how to win the long jump. It's just one of the events he's medaled in during various Special Olympics games, both locally and nationally. But he says his favorite and most dominant event is the mile. I'm like the tallest one on there. I feel like, oh great, we gotta go up against you. Keith says his 6'5 frame has propelled him to wide margin wins. They're like, can you uh, give us a 10 second start? I was like, mm, I was like, nah. He even compares himself to one of Montana's rodeo greats, a seven time world champion. I'm the Don Mortensen of the mile. How so? Because I grew up watching him, Don Atmetra, and he never gave up. Spending his early years on the Fort Belknap Reservation, King is approaching 25 years as a Special Olympics athlete. That includes basketball and tribal dancing at opening ceremonies that signifies great tradition. It's a warrior dance. I love it. We sneak up on the enemies, plus we, we sneak up on the, when we hunt, we take it back to our families, and then we serve it to them. It's something that, in his words, weighs heavy on him. I mean, plus, we dance for our families and our friends, that, you know, if they're sick and they're going through something. Keith says his head-to-toe gear includes a bustle with 18 eagle feathers, and on top, a roach made with porcupine and two more eagle feathers. Those with Special Olympics Montana say they're noticing an uptick in Native American participation. Keith even recalls his presence being notable and somewhat lighthearted a few years ago when his basketball team placed third at the national games in New Jersey. People from East Coast are like, we thought you were going to have your war paint on. And I was like, nah. I had this one player was like, look, mom, I'm real. We're, this is a real live Indian. And I was like, so I was thinking all the big retraction. I was like, it was pretty cool and got to see the ocean for the first time. Maybe he gets back someday, but in the meantime, this proudly tall athlete is all about taking care of business. I just, you know, kicking butt and taking names. Scott Breen, MTN Sports. That is the kind of attitude I strive to have. Oh my God. Uh, thanks, Scott, for bringing that highlight. That I, was awesome. I love that. One of just the many Special Olympic athletes that are going to be competing this month over in Billings. So it'll sure be a good yep. thing to see. Now, before we head into a break, talking about fun things to see at an airport, you, you see a lot of characters yeah. there, but not these characters usually. This is a nice mix of Jedi and and a little young Padawans yeah, as well. That's right. Now, of course, over the weekend was the 4th of May, but a lot of Star Wars fans have kind of adopted that day as May the 4th. Yeah, that's right. Sort May of, the 4th be with you. Exactly. Sort of just a big celebration of the love of the Star Wars movies, the trilogy, the lore, everything that you could think of. So this is over in China. They were oh, able wow. to gather at an airport. I mean, even Darth Vader has to use no, the escalator, sure. am I right? No stairs for that, Sith Lord. Yeah. Uh, see, Different but, kind of force. <laughs> exactly right. I mean, how cool would this be if you had no idea this was going on? Yeah. What would you think? No, Security's be, tightened yeah, up. That's right. What's going on Can here? I see your ID? You don't need to see his ID. <laughs> exactly. The, this is not the person you are looking for. That's right. I love it. I just think that it's so fun. All right, Matt, that means you and I, we got to think, does May 4th maybe fall on a week? Day next oh, year? that could be dangerous. I'll have to look. I got to write that down. Yep. Okay. While I'm looking the calendar, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, though, Armigan Thompson has our story from Mute.
I'm Megan Thompson here at the Butte Native Wellness Center where they're giving out indigenous meal kits and helping people connect to their culture while also offering healthy eating tips. Coming right up, we'll speak to some of the directors about the program. For 